I think this type of debate on labor is always strong. It's always fierce in South Africa. This discussion could go in many directions. So I, again, I'm going to try and narrow it down, bring it into fiscal policy. We've spoken about the pension fund issue, so I don't really want to concentrate too much on that. And I'm going to start off by literally going into some Q&A from my own side. And then we'll open up, up to the floor very quickly, because I really want to give you a, some more time to participate. I'm going to start with you, Neil, because I'd like the conversation now to go to what we were starting the day off on fiscal policy. And we all know that budget's coming up next week. We all know what's at stake here. We know that something has to happen on the public sector wage bill. And obviously, the unions are the big factor there in, in trying to find a cooperation between government and the unions themselves. So Neil, without further ado, I'm just going to ask you what you think is going on. What's the state at play? You know, we don't need a diagnosis of the problem. We know where we are. But what is possible here? And, and, and also, very importantly, what comes with, with the least consequences to the long-term in South Africa, to society? So the big question is, uh, how do we get out of the current crisis, the economic stagnation that we're in at the moment? And, uh, you know, Michael said, well, you know, there are, two, there are two options that have been floated. The one is, you know, brutal consolidation or basically austerity. And the other is fiscal stimulus. And he discounted both of them for, for, for different reasons. In my view, clearly there has to be a stimulus. Uh, currently what's happening is that with the creeping austerity that has happened uh, over the last five or so years, and now full-blown austerity, which is going to be introduced in the budget uh, uh, next week, um, what, what we're doing is we're systematically squeezing the economy. Uh, we've got very restrictive monetary policy combined with very restrictive fiscal policy, which economists talk, call pro-cyclical economic policy. In other words, it deepens the cycle of the current economic uh, trajectory, which is essentially we're moving towards a recession. And austerity is going to push, push us into a full-blown recession. So we need a coordinated macroeconomic policy, both, both monetary and fiscal, which uh, begins to inject stimulus into the economy. So the idea that you can tinker around the edges, that you can cut back a bit on public sector wages, that you can consolidate here and there, as Michael quite correctly said, it's the poor who are getting squeezed, it's services that are getting slashed. Uh, and therefore, the elephant in the room now is the question of public sector wages. And if I took a poll now, uh, here amongst everyone, I guarantee that probably more than 80 to 90% would agree with the statement that we have a bloated public service. But when you disaggregate that picture, it's a very different story. Uh, I can't go into it in detail now. We've got a, a brief that we've done uh, for the job summit, which, which goes into the figures, the international and local figures, which we'll give to you to circulate if people are interested. But basically, in, in, in international terms, in comparative terms, the percentage of the population that is employed in the public service is very low by international standards. Uh, the number of people employed in the public service in 1994 and now has completely failed to keep up with population growth. But what we've had is a massive change in the composition of the public service, with huge uh, amounts of resources getting diverted into the high-paid echelons of the bureaucracy. Um, so the composition of the wage bill and the structure is the, is the fundamental problem. There's this notion of right-sizing the public service. So it's about restructuring the public service so that more resources go into delivery, into healthcare, into uh, policing, into education. Because currently there's no, there's no disagreement that we have massive shortages in all those areas. And what the figures show is that we have over 200,000 vacancies in the public service, many of them in these, in these areas. So the notion that you can cut back either on the wages of those frontline service delivery workers or on the employment of, of, of them is, is clearly ludicrous. Um, so it, the idea is to begin to repurpose uh, and restructure the public service in a way which you bring a lot of the administration to support frontline service delivery, in which you begin to reduce the number of unproductive bureaucrats, in which you begin to cap uh, wages at the, higher, at, at the higher end. So this is a very different solution from what people think 
intuitively as a sort of solution that's being put forward out, uh, in, in the media very, very widely. I want to get that's back sort to of that, headline. for sure. Would you like to, to pick up? At all, you're nodding away, I see, there's something there. Well, absolutely. Um, uh, first and foremost, I think it's important that your audience must know that um, as NUMSA, we are primarily a metal workers union. Um, since 2013, of course, we have broadened our scope. We are now in infrastructure. We are all the way along the value chain of aviation and transportation uh, and mining as well now. Um, so in terms of the public sector wage bill, for us, uh, we're not represented in, you know, health care services, etc. But where we are represented is certainly at state-owned entities, ESCOM, mm -hmm. South African Airways, and Donnell in particular. And um, we have seen certainly a very um, misleading narrative in the media in relation to state-owned entities where the attack is directed at workers where the assumption, and it's something that many economists go into great lengths to elaborate on, um, but it's actually based on a lie, which is that um, particularly at South African Airways or at ESCOM, the problem is the large wage bill. That's simply not true. ESCOM itself has said on many, many different platforms, even when they went to NURSA to apply for tariff increases, their biggest cost driver is IPPs and the cost of coal. That is their biggest cost driver. At South African Airways, the biggest cost driver is the, is the um, corrupt procurement spend, which on average is 25 billion rand a year. Now, where, what I did not hear in the discussion earlier today when they were discussing and they touched on um, the wage bill is the issue of corruption and the, and the role that this corruption has played in the destruction of these state-owned entities. Um, the fact that ESCOM and SAA continually need to be bailed out is because of the corrupt procurement spend. There are many, many evergreen bloated contracts which are literally choking these entities to the point of destruction, particularly at ESCOM where you've got bloated coal contracts where there has been no intervention and now that, that, that expenditure now includes IPPs uh, which are also choking ESCOM, and, and that cost gets passed directly onto the consumer. At South African Airways, you've got bloated contracts in the form of uh, jet fuel, in the form of cargo from companies like Bid Air, and because you have politicians who have a vested interest in these entities, either through shareholding or because of relationships with relatives, as is the case at ESCOM and IPPs, um, there's no intervention. But the only discussion that we must talk about here is that we must cut back on the wage bill, as if that's going to solve the problem when the problem is corruption at the highest level. Oh, that's a very good point. I mean, carry on, just picking up from there. Yes. Do you want to add your... If I can add on what, what Camille is saying, um, we are trade unionists. So mm -hmm. members join the trade union uh, mostly for, for job security. They want protection. So obviously that's our role. That's why we have members and whatever we do in one industry or sector, our members in the other sector say, is this the union that we can belong to that will protect our job? So, so that is our role. Obviously we know there's a specific reality. We need to deal with those realities. But just to add on, you know, if we look at, at, at ESCOM, for instance, uh, Camille was referring to the procurement. What the, the new management are busy dealing with all those contracts, just to give you a, a quick example, they are paying 22 rand for one roll of one ply toilet paper, 45 rand for one plastic bag, 45 rand for a bottle of water, 900 rand for a tin of re-coffee. They pay for a specific valve that you use quite often at at the power plant, uh, 210,000 rand, it costs you 92,000 if you buy it over the counter. So those are the things that obviously um, increase the, the costs. Um, and that's why we, as unionists, strongly believe that we must protect every single worker. You know, and even at, you know, the some uh, contractors, management side, because we also know what the effect, the social impact is on workers, on their families, their extended families. We see in the mining industry that 10 plus 
dependent. So, so that's the last thing you can create. So what you need to do, you need to grow the economy. You need to look at ways to grow the economy. Obviously, to weed out corruption. And I think what we require is what they did in Singapore. They got together all the social partners and they said, what do we need to do to grow the, this economy? And let's put ideology aside. Now, our history, we cannot run away from our history. So obviously, you have to make sacrifice and say, but certain things are sacrosanct, certain things you have to have to still have in place as a result of our history. But then you need to look at those ways to grow the economy. Look at, at the things that, that's under our control, the things that we can manage. There's policy certainty that, that is required in so many industries. If we look at this whole um, issue around land and expropriation without compensation, on the one hand, the politicians will say, but don't worry, don't worry, X, Y, and Z will only happen. Uh, investors, your uh, investments are safe. But then get to that point where, where they know that. And those are the kind of things. There's poor leadership uh, from business, from government, and, and obviously, we are open for criticism from the union side as well. But if we don't fix the things that we can fix, you know, in the end, we will just go in circles and we have the situation where the quick fix is just get rid of the workers. Uh, and, and that is something that we cannot, as unionists, but also as South Africans. We know this, the high unemployment rate. We need to get the youth into jobs, you know, two-thirds of the youth um, that qualified last year got matric will, will, will get a job. Only a two-third will not get a job. Only a third will get a job for those who are qualified. So those are the issues that, that we have to deal with. But in the end, I don't think we have a, a goal that everybody worked towards. Mm. You know, we're in it for ourselves, and, and that's as a result of just simply poor leadership.